Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I really do want to thank all of the speakers. And I understand um, this is not just an inter intergenerational issue. The Bay Area, the entire state of California, San Francisco in particular, clearly, clearly have a profound affordability crisis. There, there's, there's no question about that. You don't need to read the latest poll to know that that is on everybody's minds. It's real. Um, and and the, there are many, many ways to solve it. Um, and as I spoke to earlier, uh, we have collectively, over time, whether it's affordable housing bonds, accessory dwelling unit policy, tenant protections, home SF, um, have been chipping away at it. And, and, and we should also, everybody is entitled to their opinions, but um, as my former colleague, Supervisor Wiener, used to say, you're not entitled to your own set of facts. So when I hear speakers say that we've only developed 2,000 units over the last 30 years, that's patently untrue. Um, it is true that San Francisco has actually um, been, albeit we could do better, been at the forefront of creating both luxury market rate units as well as more affordable units than any of our counterparts. And I actually appreciate the notion that Senator Weiner is coming forth with, which is that there should be housing equity around the region and around the state. But as that map shows, this doesn't quite do that. This actually rezones a very, very small part of the Bay Area. I was part of a movement, as, was, as were many of my colleagues, to encourage our neighbors to the south to use the Baylands for thousands of units of new affordable housing starts. That was something where the Board of Supervisors and the YIMBYs and our planning director all agreed. Um, so, and, and, I, and I associate myself with the individuals uh, who indicated that this is not a one-size-fits-all uh, solution. I want to say to Senator Weiner and his colleagues in the state legislature, the simple notion, which is show us the money. You want to help? Get us state resources. We were around when we used the redevelopment agency, not as, the old redevelopment agency was the history of displacement, but the agency that was dissolved was actually an affordable housing agency. Give us those tools. Give us state resources so that we can use the properties that we have for 100% affordable housing projects. I think the Yimbys and the older generation um, can all support that. I can say as a District 3 supervisor, Virtually every single piece of vacant land, whether it was Broadway and Battery, Broadway and Sansom, Broadway and Front Street, that we all got after we tore down, thank God, the Embarcadero Freeway, we have repurposed for 100% affordable housing. We are looking to do that at the fire station, legislation that I introduced at 530 Sansom Street, which is a one-story with a mezzanine fire station where we could build 200 feet of affordable housing. We're looking at those opportunities all over the city. And as you heard from Commissioner Richards, there are tens of thousands of units in the pipeline. And to the individual who said, um, this, is, this takes time, um, that's a true fact. But I also wanted to, because much has been made of the Planning Commission's uh, memo, there are actually two of them. Um, the most recent, dated March the 8th, that addresses um, the Senate bill as revised. And there's a lot in there for everybody, but I, w I just want to call out a few top line highlights. Um, and then I want to go actually into some of the language of the legislation. I know this is a highly emotionally charged issue. I don't know how many people uh, for or against uh, Senate Bill 827 have actually read the legislation as amended. But to the planning department's uh, memorandum, Senate Bill 827 may preclude the city from rezoning any property to PDR, production, distribution, and repair, in order to protect industrial districts and uses in San Francisco. Um, I think that's important because planning has to be done holistically. The bill provides potentially very large increases in zoning and density without time or resources for city to, cities to concurrently adopt measures to mitigate impacts. Senate Bill 827, Senate Bill 827's definition of transit richness is broad. 
especially for corridors, and it goes on to speak to that. Trying zoning to, tying zoning to transit service introduces substantial uncertainties over time. It's a memo worth reading. I, I don't think anybody here um, would say that our planning department is not pro-growth or pro-housing, so I commend that memorandum to you. Um, as to the bill itself, um, and while I certainly appreciate the fact that Senator Weiner has now allowed uh, in his amendments for local demolition controls. Um, let, let's speak to all of the language that is set forth herein uh, with regard to displacement. And um, to me, this is frightening language because what it contemplates is the mass destruction of units and I guess to the good contemplates certain rights for displaced individuals. And to me, that harks back uh, to the bad old days of the original um, urban development that uh, tore people's lives and families apart, not only in San Francisco, but in urban areas around the United States. So section 65918.8b uh, defines eligible displaced person and uh, it goes on to say uh, any person who occupies property that is located within the development and who will become displaced by the development. Any person who moves from property located within the boundaries of the development after an application for a development proposal subject to a transit-rich housing bonus is deemed complete. Um, it goes on to say uh, a development proponent shall prepare a detailed reloca relocation benefits and assistance plan, this is supposed to make us happy, and submit that plan to the applicable local government for approval to determine whether the plan complies with the requirements of this section, which are as follows. A, diagra a, a diagrammatic sketch of the project area, projected dates of displacement, a written analysis of the aggregate relocations of all eligible re relocation needs of all eligible displaced persons and a detailed explanation as to how these needs are to be met. A written analysis of relocation housing resources, including vacancy rates of the neighborhood and surrounding areas. Well, that's not going to be good news. A detailed description of relocation payments to be made and a plan for disbursement. It goes on to say, after the applicable, this goes on for pages, but after the applicable local government approves the relocation uh, benefits and assistance plan, the eligible applicant shall do the following notify all eligible displaced persons of the availability of relocation benefits and assistance, the eligibility requirements of relocation benefits and assistance, the procedures for obtaining such, uh, the extent of their needs, um, supply each eligible displaced person information concerning federal and state housing programs. Well, great, that's really helpful. Um, and, and it goes on and on. I mean, the eligible, and, and then here's the stuff that gets really disturbing, an eligible applicant's obligation to provide relocation benefits, this is the developer, and assistance to an eligible displaced person shall cease if any of the following occurs. An eligible displaced person moves to a comparable replacement dwelling and receives all assistance and payments to which he or she is entitled. That one sounds good. Number two, an eligible displaced person moves to substandard housing, refuses reasonable offers of additional assistance in moving to a decent, safe, and sanitary replacement dwelling and receives all payments. Uh, three, the eligible applicant has failed to trace or locate the eligible displaced person after making reasonable efforts to do so. Number three, that is terrible. That is terrible. Number four, an eligible displaced person from his or her dwelling unit refuses reasonable offers of assistance. Well, who's going to enforce that? Um, I will, you can read it, it's all set forth in there, but um, if the state wants to help cities with our housing and displacement crisis, we need to repeal Costa Hawkins, advance split role, Prop 13 reform, reform the Ellis Act, create a vacancy tax, which I intend to propose for this November's ballot, uh, continue to do the kind of work we've done to strengthen owner move-in eviction um, controls, uh, and, and to do what we are going to do, and hopefully more robustly. Uh, I, for one, think that the Central Soma plan needs to have more housing, not less. I think the 7,000 units proposing that plan, and I've said it, this land use committee is not enough. We have an unparalleled opportunity there to actually build tens of thousands of units of housing in the Central Soma plan, and I hope we avail ourselves of that. Um, Supervisor Tang, I hope that, I, I, I look forward to 
ironing this thing out with you, but I hope that um, we can work with Senator Weiner uh, to make reasonable amendments. I think first and foremost amongst those is the fundamental notion of value recapture. And I think that we need to set some goalposts for Senator Weiner, Assemblymember Ting, uh, Senator um, Nancy Skinner, uh, and the entire Assembly uh, and Senate delegations. Um, and I think we need to put some mile markers out there. So I would hope that we can put forth a qualified opposition resolution saying that we are going to oppose it uh, if we do not get substantial, meaningful uh, amendments in the bill. And with that, I will relinquish the microphone. Thank you. And thank you, Supervisor Peskin, for reading us Senator Weiner's entire legislation to us. <laughs>